Satan's main ploy is to destroy us. Last night, I felt something heavy in my heart. I went outside and I sat and I prayed, Captain was worried about this. You have something in your heart sometimes where you just need to go outside and pray to the Lord, there's something that does not feel right to it. With me, it's something I said it did. But God revealed to me. He said, the good news is, is that what, what, the, what this church is doing is faithful and pleasing to Him. The bad news is that we're going to become targeted in the coming year. There are people that were once our friends that will become our enemies. There are people that will leave us because they don't understand us. There are people in our family that will disown us. I'm preparing for this. In the coming year, we need to be more steadfast in the truth than ever before. It will not be our fault. Do not blame yourself. When you stand for Jesus, you will be alone when it comes to the world. We were studying that last night. Back in the Book of Jeremiah, when God called the nation of Israel outcast. He says you'll be an outcast among the nations. And when you think of the word outcast, you think of something bad in a negative way. You're an outcast, like people of the family. So, here God made it for good, saying, because you have been chosen from among the world, you will be hated, and you will be treated like an outcast. Is that true today of Israel? Sure is. And that not only applies to Israel, but it applies to us as well. Our people believe more in the government than in God. Our people believe more in our president than Jesus. Our people put our faith in the things of man than in the things of God. That's why there's so much discouragement and disheartening and misunderstanding and confusion. People don't understand that when you put your faith in the things of man, it will fail us. But they don't get that yet. Here in these churches, they have allowed the world to come in in some way or, or another. You remember in the book of Ephesians, if you give the devil a foothold, he will take over. You cannot give the devil a foothold. It's in it. We're going to study this evening in Revelation chapter 2, the church of Tyrosera. We've gone over this before a few months, but I think it was in uh, July, so we went over this. And this is the refresher to those when we look at this church that brings us to what is happening in today's church. There's going to be some points that are pointed out here that many people will find. I don't know what it is. I don't think it's my personality. I think it's just telling you what it is. But if you're leading the church as a female, you're in the wrong church. A lot of people will say, wait, wait, explain that more to me. If your pastor is a female, she is not called or qualified by God to be the pastor of the church. Is that clear enough? We're not politically correct. We're not a member of the National Organization for Women. We're not part of the Democrat Party that believes that you throw out God's rules and you put in progressive man's rules. We don't do that. We don't roll that way here. And God made it very clear in this church, he doesn't roll that way even. He was very disheartened and very disappointed in the church because they allowed progressive liberalistic ideas to invade the church. And he called them out on it when he said this, listen, I know your works and I know what is going on. You know, it's very interesting when you look at, when you look at the things of God and you think, oh, God doesn't know what I'm doing, you know, God doesn't see what I'm doing. God knows everything that we say and do. He knows the intent of our heart. He knows what we words we say before we say them, actions we do before we even do them. God knows everything. God knows the intent more than the motive and action itself. We cannot appease the things of this world. We, our, our purpose as a church is not to please the world, it's to please our Lord. Our purpose is to preach the gospel like every creature, to baptize them in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and teach them the things of the church. That's what we're supposed to do. But this church wasn't doing that. I often wonder why our church is in existence if they're not doing God's work. That makes no sense. Let's look at this. 
And to the angel in verse 18, chapter 2, and to the angel of the church of there was here, right? These things say the Son of God who has his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine grass. This is a very vivid description of Jesus Christ. And we go back to Revelation of the Memory, chapter 1. When John actually saw Jesus, and we see the very same details that he saw Jesus with. Now, why did, why did John repeat this? It's because he saw the same Jesus in chapter 1, like he did in chapter 2. His eyes were like a flame of fire, which means judgment. And his feet were like fine brass. That means that he's been purified. The Lord Jesus Christ purified purify those that believe in him. I know your works in charity, in service and faith, and our patience, and our work. And the last three more than the first. Jesus is saying, I know your service, your works, your faith, and your charity. And that is to be committed for. But, there's always a but. The purpose of the church is to preach the gospel and to teach the truth. The main purpose of the church is not to be, like it says in verse 19, the first part, the first point of the church is not to be like the Salvation Army. You have the Salvation Army for that. The, the church can do those services. They can branch up and do those services to serve the community. That's great. But that should not be the number one purpose of the church. The number one purpose of the church is to preach the gospel and thirty preaching. And to teach those and to baptize them and to propagate God's truth going forward. That's the purpose of the church. Now listen to the first thing that he pointed out here. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. A few things against thee. Because thou allowed that suffers that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed as a life. Now I want you to look at verse 20 carefully, and then we're going to go into the history of it. I have a few things against me. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving me this condemnation. He's going to give me this evaluation to the church. You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself, and look at this, she calls herself a prophet. God never called her. Did you notice that? God never said, I called that woman. God never said, I appointed that woman to leave the church. He never said that. He said, You allow this woman who calls herself a prophet. Yeah. God has appointed leaders to lead his church. No board, no committee, no convention, no popular vote, no poll calls people to lead the church. God himself chooses and appoints those to lead his church. No one ever grows up saying, I want to be a pastor. I didn't say that when I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be a doctor when I wanted to grow up, when I was growing up. What do you want to do when you grow up, Pete? I want to be a doctor and help people. The furthest thing from my mind was to be a pastor or a preacher. That was not my choice. That was, I did not grow up believing and thinking that. God chose me and God called me. My father had no part in it. My father did not say, when you grow up, you're going to pass me. He never said that. Mom says, no. If he's going to do that, then your heavenly father is going to call him. No one appointed me to do what I'm doing. I was called by God himself to do it. What's the point? In churches today, and those that are listening, I wish there were more people listening out there. Maybe they were. Maybe they could catch on fire soon. If you're led by someone that has been appointed by man and not by God, you are not led by God in the church. Let me let's repeat that again. God appointed Moses. God chose David. God chose Mary. We bring up the first uh, the birth and birth of Jesus Christ. God chose his disciples. Remember when he told them, I called you. You didn't call me, but I chose you. Do you remember that? God calls his people to lead in the church. A pastor does not appoint and say, you know what, I think you look good to be a pastor in the church. You got the look, you got the, you got the it factor. 
This is not Simon Cowell. God is calling people to lead his church. He calls farmers, he calls tax collectors, he calls doctors, he called me. To this day, I have no idea why he called me. But that's not the point. The point is, you've been drafted, son, and you're going to serve in God's army. Yes, sir. And this church allows this woman to come in and says, you know what? I call myself the National Organization of Women's Designing Women, and I could do all that and more. So I'm going to leave this church. Really? Really? You know, a sin isn't every single thing. It's just bigger, bigger, bigger. So pebble in the pond with a still and see how the ripples just come forth and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So they allowed this woman to come in, listen to what she did. She she taught and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. Seduce is a very powerful word here. When one is seduced, they are led away like sheep to the slaughter. They have no idea what's going on. When you're seduced, you're in a state of limbo. You're being led. You don't think for yourself. You don't think, what would God want me to do? You're being busy following someone. To commit fornication. You know, it's very interesting in the church today that the one thing in the church that we used to do that we don't do anymore is that we don't call sin. We do not call sin sin. We are scared, timid, shy to call sin sin. We back away. We shy away. We do not want to make enemies. We don't want to lose our standing in the community because we don't call sin sin. We don't want to look bad in our family saying, look, this is sin. And our families look at us and says, who made you judge and jury? Folks, it is not a sin to call sin, sin. It is not a sin to say what it is. Heck, I do it all the time. I say, look, this is a sin. Repent of your sins and give out with God. I say that to myself. I repent all the time. I don't make a show of it. I do it privately because I'm so shameful of myself. But the church needs to get its gumption back. The church needs to get its bravado back. And call sin for what it is. It's sin. Crossroad Community Church will be the leading forefront to call sin, sin. I don't care what the other churches think. I don't care what they say. They're not my problem. God has appointed me to be responsible for this church. And we're going to call sin, sin. Let's look here and here. The church where tolerance of the key. Woo! In this past election, I heard this word so many times. We need to tolerate things, folks. That's what's wrong with us. We need to tolerate. We need to let things be bygones, be bygones. We need to stop being so nitpicky. We need to stop. Really. Let's look at the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter. Lesson 7. It says here, the church of Thyatira was somewhat obscure and insignificant, though its members were loving, active, and determined. However, while some stayed true to the faith, others fell for the wicked teachings and practices of Jezebel. And still others kept, listen to this, still others kept their distance from her, but tolerated her deception. You know what? Okay, she's here. I don't agree with her, but I'm not going to say anything. How many of us have been guilty of that? You know what? I don't believe that. Apparently, I don't. I don't care for that. But you know what? I'm not going to make waves. I'm not going to cause ripples. But I personally, I disagree. No, 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 no. That, that is more. Christ, listen to this. His singing rebuke left little room for an indecision. Only one of the three gifts was an option for faith to believe. On January 11, 1999, the cover of Christianity Today, Virgin Magazine, I believe, asked the following question: Are you tolerant? Should you be? Over the last several decades, tolerance has become one of the greatest listeners' virtues in our increasing secular society. 
Now remember, this was written in 1999, which teaches that everyone's belief values and lifestyles should be accepted. Now I'm going to read this to you again. Everyone's belief values and lifestyles should be accepted. Mm. After all, some may reason, isn't Christianity all about love and grace? Are we supposed to accept people for who they are to God? Isn't God supposed to accept them if He truly loves them? To accept them as they are? Really? Listen to this. If you don't approve, just keep quiet. Have you been told that? Don't rock the boat. If you don't like it, there's the door. That's amazing. People that stand up for the truth are the ones being shown the door. Or those that are ignorant in sin live on. Tolerance has become such a powerful force, the only thing that can't be tolerated is intolerance. Seventy four, page seventy four. Right over the page. If you turn on the television or radio, you'd be quickly observed that much of the virtue of tolerance has been pushed into this. Day. This is so good. Oh my word. We need to write this in, in the YouTube video. A culture that tolerates evil calls disagreement a phobia. Are we a homophobe? Hmm. Taking a stand is considered hate. Oh, you must, you must be a hater to take a stand against that. Conviction is seen as fanaticism. We're fanatic? Christian doctrine is regarded as, listen to this, discrimination? Notice how the devil puts words in people's mouths in their heads, right? And yes, this is of the devil, folks. Listen to this. This is a thing in the in itself. As in many watered down churches today, watered down churches? Wow. They've lost their effectiveness in some way? This situation also prevailed with the ancient church of Thyatira. In his letter to that church, Christ, listen to this, Christ addressed the issue of big sins in a small church and the even bigger issue of tolerating those sins. Go to page 75, look at the book of the book. What I'm about to say after I read this, you better write it down and those better listen to it. It's important to me, it's given me. Not because I say it, it's because God has put this in my heart to say it. This is in God. Folks, God is just happy. You think you weren't happy with this election? Woo! I'm very disappointed in the church because we didn't do as much as we should have been helping with the church. Let's go here to 75. In the little box here, doorway to the street. Thyretia was originally founded, as, listen to this. The, the town itself, Thyretia, was originally found, founded as a shrine to the sun god Periminus. The description was similar to that of Christ in Revelation 2 18. Wow. The sun god. The same sun god, where do you think these people got the sun god from? Here a minute. If you trace the sun god, it goes all the way back to the Egyptians. I'm telling you folks, the practices of today's church have been gone back to the Babylonian and Egyptian empire. We have carried that with us today. Sin spreads to every culture, every time period. Whose deception, whose description was that similar of Christ in Revelation 18? Though not well known in ancient history, if I was here again, a reputation as a blue collar town, blue collar town where the trade guilds sit at the center of social and religious life. This situation created a serious problem for the Christians of South Now listen to this. See if this sounds similar, very familiar. Membership in the trade guild came with pagan religious obligations. If you wanted to work in the city, you'd have to compromise your values. You have to tolerate certain things. Does that sound familiar? Membership in this trade guild came with a pagan religious obligation, and refusing to join a trade guild announcement meant that you gave up your room to make a living. Acts 
Sin spreads. Sin gets worse. Sins affect all people. Here in this county, if you did not join this membership, you couldn't earn a living. So what are you going to do? you got to earn a living to put food on the table, right? What do I do, Pastor? I've got to do this. No, you don't have to do this. God is greater than the union. God is greater than this town. God is greater than anything. He will put food on your table. That's the, that's the, uh, the Israeli nation. Water from a rock, manna from heaven. God will do it. Look at the Red Sea with Moses. He opened the way when there was no other way. Let us not diminish what God can do. Let us uplift what God can do. Let us let us go to God and say, Lord, you could do this. You could do this for me. Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'll leave the details and, the, and all the sweat to you. You handle that. But I'm going to follow you, and you're going to provide for me. Don't compromise your values just for the sake of saying, i got to do this. Don't, don't give up what you got in order to get. God will give it to you if you ask. Now listen, look at this. In the light of the dilemma in which the Christians of ever care upon themselves, the woman Jezebel mentioned in 620 may have represented a group that advocated Christianity. Christian participation in the pagan ritual of the trade guild, which included idolatry, ritual immorality, and worship. There will come a time when God will test you. And God will ask you to stand up for him. God is going to ask you, ma'am, sir, will you stand for me? Will you stand for God's truth and his principles? Will you stand for what is right? You shall meet him in the line one day when they tell you worthless. If you want to keep your job, you can ask me. 